All right, we're ready to get started then. Um, welcome. Welcome from um, a relatively warm Pittsburgh, North Carolina and a few points beyond. Um, you as special friends of RAFI, we're, uh, we're really glad you're with us today for this special open house. We're excited to present this information to you today. First, thanks to the uh, staff who made that nice little slide set to introduce us to some of the work color and, uh, uh, and opportunities within uh, our program area. My name is Jerry DeWitt. I am, I'm on the board of directors here at uh, RAFI USA. I'm also the president of the board and I live in North Carolina, fairly close to Pittsburgh. Uh, let me tell you very briefly about our board of directors. We're 11 men and women from across the country. Actually, we're from New Mexico, Virginia, um, North Carolina, and the uh, District of Columbia at the present time. We 11 are, um, have vast experiences and uh, life experiences and talents. We represent nonprofits, uh, communication area, education, government, farmers, faith community, et cetera. Uh, we try to reflect in our, uh, in our presence, uh, the work and uh, the mission of, uh, of RAFI USA. Our board um, at the present time, we um, were quite engaged. We, we try to meet four times a year. Uh, of course, right now we can't meet face to face. Um, we do then also try to meet monthly as an executive committee to provide a follow up with some direct uh, 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 feedback to Edna and staff as on a monthly basis. So we're quite engaged. And then a number of the staff that we are going to meet here in a minute uh, call us regularly and uh, we engage with them and provide support when, it's, when we can and when it's appropriate. Our, um, our board, um, they're really a, a, a great board. They, they so believe in the mission statement and you saw that mission statement on the uh, slide set, but basically uh, to remind you we're all, what we're all about at RAFI USA is uh, we're looking at those root causes of, of, a, of an unjust food system that permeates much of America. Uh, we work through policy and programs and what we're really trying to do is to come up with uh, support and, and advocate for more just economically, more just uh, racially, more just e ecologically, uh, farm community. So it's really people and structure that we want to impact positively. To do that, you have to have an outstanding staff and we at RAFI USA, we certainly do. I can't tell you how much the board appreciates working with Edna and all of the staff at RAFI USA. The, uh, the staff are, um, and you're only going to hear from some of them today, um, the number of them behind the scenes that are providing the, the, the richness that you're going to explore here in just a little bit. Uh, they're creative, they're uh, very determined, they're hardworking, inspiring, and impactful. Last uh, thing I would tell you from a board perspective is that we on the board, uh, we don't pretend to know everything or have all the answers. So you are our special supporters. You have great ideas. Uh, you've been supporters for a short term for a long time. You have thoughts. Um, give me some thoughts through email or better yet, if you want to chat with one or more of us, uh, let me know and we'll uh, have Edna set up a, a Zoom call and over a cup of coffee, we can listen to you and hear your ideas. You're important to us and that's why we're here with you today. So um, to lead us through and here's some exciting stuff and you're going to be impressed. Um, it's going to blow you away. What we're doing uh, is Edna Rodriguez. Edna is our current executive director. Edna has been a joy to work with from the board perspective. Uh, she's been with Rafi more than 10 years in the development arena, then director of operations. And now the last three and a half years, uh, Edna has been the executive director and we're so very pleased that she's on board. So with that, um, we're gonna turn it over to you to Edna, uh, take it away. Thank you, Jerry, appreciate it. Oh my God, I see my giant face on this huge monitor in front of me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, my name is Edna Rodriguez and I'm the executive director. Um, this is our very first open house. We've never done this before. So uh, I ask for your patience if things don't go as smoothly as we had planned, um, but I think it'll, it'll be just fine. I also wanna thank uh, Susan and Beth for putting this together. This was all their idea and they did all of the work to get uh, the staff uh, ready for this. Um, so much appreciated. And thank you for you, uh, for your attendance and your interest in learning more about the organization. Um, couple of housekeeping things that I wanna share. The first is that we are recording. I think, well, are we recording? Yes, we are recording. You see the little red button at the top of the, of the screen. Um, wanted to make sure everybody knew that. Um, we are not intending on sharing that video externally. We're only gonna be using it for internal purposes. But if you have a uh, problem with that, please direct your concerns at Susan um, and we'll change our plans. 
Um, a little bit about the agenda uh, for today. We're scheduled to meet for about an hour, uh, maybe less, but not more. We promise not to go over an hour. Um, we're gonna start off with a brief intro on my part, followed by staff presentations. Each staff member that's here is gonna present from one to three minutes, and they'll share some about the work that they're doing um, and some of the work that they have ahead. After that, we're gonna have a Q&A session where you have the opportunity to ask questions. And we ask that you if, you, if you have questions that come to you while people are talking, that you enter your questions in the little chat um, box and indicate who the question is for. Or if you can't access the chat, just hold the question until we get to the Q&A part. So thank you, Jerry, for uh, talking about the mission of the organization. I appreciate that. I was gonna start there, but I'll start by mentioning that the mission that Jerry sh uh, shared is actually a revised and revamped mission. We completed a strategic planning process late last year. Um, and so this is all new to us. It's not drastically different from what we had before. It's just updated to reflect who we are today. Key changes being emphasis on root causes and a focus on racially just communities that wasn't there before. We do our work and advance our mission in a variety of ways through programs that provide direct service, that work with farmers and communities. And then we also do policy and advocacy work that is informed by that very work. And you'll be hearing more about that. All of this work that we do has, has changed. Um, the pandemic has changed everything. It's not just our work. It's changed how we work, how we meet, how we collaborate. And it's also changed the needs and the demands of the people that we serve. So this past year has been a challenging one for us. We've been adapting to, the, to those needs. And frankly, it's been a lot more work for all of us. Um, and I'm thankful for the staff um, being so hardworking and being up for the challenge of meeting that. We're gonna get started today with um, Michelle Osborne, who is with the Come to the Table program. The Come to the Table program is about 10 years old um, and it was formed to bring together people of faith farmers and food and farm advocates to address food insecurity in rural communities. The program has evolved since then to do much more, but I'll let Michelle um, provide some more information. Michelle? Hey everybody, uh, it's great to be here and it's great to get to talk with y'all this afternoon. Um, so as Edna mentioned, I, worked with, I work with the Come to the Table program. So really the big thing about Come to the Table is we connect. We connect um, programs within RAFI. We connect um, people out in the community to each other. So I'll give you all a few examples of how we do that. Um, as Edna mentioned, all of our work has changed with the pandemic. So come to the table historically, we do a lot of events, um, in-person events. We had to shift that um, this past year. We did um, several virtual events, but we also used um, the time and energy and funding that we might have put into events and shifted that to offer mini grants to churches. So we were able to offer about $70,000 um, total to 70 churches throughout North Carolina last year that were able to purchase food from either local farmers, local restaurants, local food, food store operators, grocery store, et cetera, um, people involved in local food systems because especially at the beginning of the pandemic, we saw the, um, the ways that our, you know, corporatized industrial food system was breaking down and the need for um, local support. And so churches were able to purchase from farmers. Um, in many cases, we were able to connect them with farmers in our networks, and then they distributed that food in their community. So it was really um, feeding two birds with one stone kind of scone kind of thing of um, meeting multiple needs at once. Um, as I mentioned, come to the table. Um, we do a lot of events. So we're going to be holding our next conference in 2022, March of 2022 in Greenville, North Carolina. Um, and historically that conference brings together farmers, faith leaders, farmers market managers, et cetera, to come together and talk about issues within their local food system and how they can work together um, to continue to build connections and find structural um, solutions to food insecurity. A last thing I'll mention is our new Farm to Church project that we've started um, this year. Our pilot project is happening in Wake County, working with eight churches in Raleigh. Um, and those churches are purchasing 
um, CSA shares from farmers within our Farmer of Color network. So we're, we're supporting three farmers um, this year through this season long CSA. And the hope is that um, it will continue throughout the summer and fall and become sustainable relationships. And we're going to expand that pilot to other areas as well. But that's been a very exciting project where churches are able to purchase from farmers that we work with. Um, I think I will stop there, but um, I'd be glad to answer questions at the end. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Michelle. Next, we're going to hear from Kelly Dale, who is the program director for the Just Foods program. Kelly is our resident expert on everything having to do with organic practices and public plant breeding and a whole lot more. Um, so, Kelly. So like Edna said, my name is Kelly Dale and I'm Just Foods program director and I've been at RAFI almost eight years now. Um, since our founding, we've been involved in the organic movement and continue to defend the integrity of organic standards. Um, we do this work through the National Organic Coalition, which we were a founding member of and are still the physical sponsor of. And this is where we develop and promote practical strategies to preserve organic standards and work on policy recommendations to ensure that strong organic standards are upheld. Um, in the Just Foods program, we also focus on our direct service work with farmers developing regionally adapted seeds. And this work grew out of the Seeds and Breeds Summit where we realized there was a need for organic commodity seed that's regionally adapted to the Southeast. The majority of your corn and soybeans that are commercially available are bred for Midwest conditions because that's where most of your corn and soybeans are grown but they're just not adapted to the climate conditions here in the Southeast. So in 2017, we began supporting a group of North Carolina organic farmers in forming a seed cooperative to grow the organic seed industry in the Southeast. And that co-op is made up of five farms, which it's a total of 11 farmers, and they are now producing their own double cross corn hybrid, um, which hasn't been done in North Carolina in almost 75 years or something. Um, and they are also growing several varieties of non-GMO soybeans. Um, we have added a project in the Just Foods program where we work with farmers in our Farmer of Color Network producing native wildflower seed because there's also a shortage of wildflower seed. In addition to all that, we also work with NC State on research grants on water availability and commodity crops when cover crops are used. And we're involved with researchers studying soil health on organic and conventional farms. Um, I feel really lucky to get to be a part of all this work because I know we're really helping the farmers. I feel that it's important that farmers have choices and options and are involved in the research that's being done on their farms. Um, a lot of times there's a disconnect between researchers and farmers because researchers just kind of show up and use a spot on the farmer's field and there's no real input from the farmer. Um, but through my work at RAFI, I get to act as a liaison between the researchers and plant breeders and the farmers and make sure that the farmer's point of view is being heard. Um, one example of that is when we were doing the soybean variety trials, when one of the farmers was cultivating like the the soybean plot, he noticed that one variety had a higher leaf set and it made it easier to cultivate. So I took that information back to the plant breeder and he said that that was not a trait he usually looked for, but since I pointed it out, he started you know, breeding for that trait. I think this work is also important because it'll, it's allowing us to increase the variety of seed that all farmers are allowed to save on their farms from year to year. And it's not patent protected. Seed costs have become a large expense because with the patent varieties, you have to buy new seed every year and there's a technology fee attached. And the varieties the co-op is producing can be saved back by all farmers. And this decreases one of their production costs, which in turn affects their bottom line. During the pandemic, my work has changed slightly. Um, we had a delay in planting the wildflower plots, um, but we were still able to get the double cross plots planted this year and the soybeans. 
and proceed getting all that work done again this coming planning season. So in a nutshell, that's what we do in the Just Foods program. Thank you, Kelly. I love how you say in a nutshell, like that's it. <laughs> Not much to it. <laughs> that was great. Um, Kelly mentioned the Seed Stewards Project, which works to um, grow pollinators in partnership with Farmers of Color. So next we have Taz Walker, who's the Senior Program Manager for the Farmers of Color Network, who will share more about the program. It's amazingly fast growth over the last two, three years um, and how the pandemic has affected it. Taz. Hey, how's everybody doing today? Um, my kids may also bust in, so I'm just giving you a forewarning. I may be, I may put out like a forearm, like I'm doing a football kind of stiff arm to them at some point. But um, so uh, my name is Taz Walker, with the senior program senior program manager at the Farmer Workers of Color Network. Um, I'm also a small farmer myself and have a small uh, farm CSA um, in Durham County. Um, the the Farmer Color Network kind of informally started in 2017, and a lot of that work came out of doing direct application support um, for farmers within our Agricultural Reinvestment Fund grant. So we had funding from Tra Tobacco Trust Fund Commission and really wanting to increase the amount of farmers of color that, um, that got funding through that program. And so just did a ton of application support the first few years. Um, I would say it also partly came out of... Um, another program that we had called the Farmer Leadership Network that was also supporting farmers of color and engaging with FSA County committees. So kind of that hybrid of work propelled us forward. Um, and so over the next three years um, from working with uh, the grant program and funding a, a, a significant number of uh, farmers of color within 20 counties, um, we've expanded over the course of three years to working now across five states in the Southeast. So. Um, as Edna mentioned, like a, a massive expansion and growth, which has been amazing. Um, the Farmer Color Network, the kind of main focus areas and goals is to support farmers of color across the Southeast um, on technical support around production needs, educational opportunities, um, and really building farm to farmer peer to peer relationships on the farm. Um, secondly, we support farmers infrastructure needs. I mentioned the grant program now, the grant program exists within the, it's called the Farmer Color Network uh, Infrastructure Fund, um, and that supports farmers uh, across the Southeast. Um, next, we also do market support and engagement. So a lot of that work looks like really just building relationships with uh, the farmers we work with and markets that they're trying to get into and really trying to do some matchmaking. So a lot of that work is really just trying to, well, before the pandemic, getting people in the same room and just kind of introducing each other them to each other so and then getting out of the way and then just following up after a few weeks to see how that relationship was going and were they having any snags in terms of building kind of a uh, building a market relationship. Um, the last kind of area of support is kind of the, the, the with the network is really around relationship building or creating kind of a cultural container for um, you know farmers in the, our network wanting to come back wanting to kind of share their stories. Um, to share their experience for younger farmers to be able to meet older farmers and to get experience. So a lot of it, um, that space is to really re rebuild and inspire, reconnect um, within the network. And we do that um, some through our farmer work brigades and also do that from um, um, through our gathering roots convenings, which have been kind of on pause within the pandemic. Um, and, and just to say a little bit, I mean, during the pandemic, I mean, we've just were, I mean, at first we were kind of running around with like just slammed like a chicken with our head cut off because, you know, every, there was a period of time that all you remember, you probably all remember in like April or May of last year where just there wasn't things on the shelf. There wasn't food on the shelf in certain places. And so we really were supporting the farmers we work with and having to pivot to different markets. Um, some that were selling wholesale were having to sell directly to consumers um in different ways and csas and food boxes so a lot of our work shifted in 2020 um and just the the work has expanded um just in terms of their market needs and market support as well as their infrastructure needs so with expanding markets there come these infrastructure needs that need to expand as well as well as labor needs so um, a lot of our work this year has shifted um has gotten busier but um we've got an amazing group of farmers we work with 
um, that I love, and um, um, that's it. Thank you, Taz. That was great. Um, Taz mentioned um, the greater greater demand that farmers experienced during the pandemic, um, and this was. Uh, something that was visible in, um, at the farmers markets. So next we're going to hear from Lisa Mish, who's the program manager for the Expanding Farmers Market Access Program. And she can talk a little bit about her experience in that particular program, what we do, why we do it, um, and how the pandemic uh, impacted that. Uh, Lisa is also the direct, ser uh, direct services team chair. And she can talk a little bit about her role in coordinating all of the direct service aspects. Uh, at Rafi. Lisa? Yeah, thanks. And, uh, and thank you all for being here. Um, as she said, my name is Lisa Mish, and I'm the program manager for expanding farmers market access. And I think of the overall goal of this program is removing barriers within local marketplaces. So that's barriers that keep farmers from being able to sell to the people that are right in their community, as well as the barriers that keep customers, especially those that are low income, from being able being able to access the food that is sold to the farmer down the road. Um, so this is the newest official program at RAFI, although the work has existed within one program or the other for the past six years or so. And I'd say the core of this work has been the Fresh Bucks program, which is a nutrition incentive program at farmer's markets. Um, and what does that mean? It's basically a program that doubles the buying power for people who receive SNAP benefits. So if I'm a SNAP recipient and I go to the farmer's market, I can swipe my EBT card for $15 and I get an extra $15 in the form of fresh bucks tokens that I can use to purchase extra fruits and vegetables at the market. Uh, so the customer benefits because they're able to buy twice as much food for their household and the farmer benefits because they get twice as much sales uh, from the customer. So we've worked with between let's say 20 to 35 or 25 to 30 farmers markets, mobile markets, kind of other alternative local markets in the last six years to provide fresh bucks incentives. Um, and I say our program stands out uh, among others that are in the state in the country because we primarily work with smaller rural low capacity farmers market, which are often the markets that can really benefit from a food access program like this. Um, and we've become a leader in technical assistance for farmers markets and farmers that want to be able to accept SNAP benefits. So this was a program that was very much impacted due to COVID. Um, a lot of households found themselves as newly food insecure. Um, so we saw dramatic increases at all the farmers markets um, with kind of record SNAP sales as you know, people you know, went on SNAP or received PEBT. Um, or needed to go to their farmer's market because there was nothing at the grocery store. Uh, as an example of this, there was one market we worked with in Windsor and they had about $43 in SNAP sales in 2019 and uh, almost a thousand in 2020. So a really dramatic increase in, in use um, and, and money that's going directly to local farmers. And it's been really meaningful to be able to coordinate a program like this during COVID because it's directly increasing families' access to fresh food. Um, usually, you know, maybe an average SNAP purchase would be $15, maybe $20. Uh, and we're seeing more that are up to $100 and $200 because people are really using their farmer's market as their source for food for their family. Um, you know, one other thing I'll say about the program is looking ahead, we're going to be, um, you know, continue to try to find secure, sustainable funding for these incentive programs. And we're launching a new project this year that's going to focus on increasing access to local markets from the farmer perspective. Um, so helping them to develop other marketplaces via the internet or with faith communities or in collaboration with other farmers. Um, so that's a snapshot of the program. And like Edna said, I also am the chair of the direct service team. Um, and this is a collaboration of all the programs that you know, work with farmers or work with community members. And really we're just trying to leverage each other's work and leverage the relationships that we form within our unique programs to reach our mission and, and the vision. Um, and sometimes that means helping each other out when we're really slammed with grant work. Sometimes it means you know, we're collectively thinking about how can we um, you know, connect with something that's happening within our policy team that's going to kind of feed fire to that effort. 
Um, so that's that's an effort that's ongoing and we're always trying to yeah find ways to uplift each other's work but i'll stop there thank you lisa a program that's core to rafi and always has been from the beginning is the farm advocacy program this is the program that provides uh, direct support and financial counseling um, to farmers in crisis we run we have a hotline um, that allows farmers to call in to get assistance to get referrals, to get uh, help dealing with creditors and anything else that they may need. We help where we can and how we can. Um, Craig Watts, our farmer advocate, will share more about the work uh, that he does. Sure, Th thank you, Edna, and, and thank y'all for, for being here today. Uh, and like you said, my name's Craig Watts and I'm a farm advocate here at Raffi. Uh, my role is to assist farmers with all kinds of stuff. We do programs, we do grants, we do financial counseling, uh, just just a myriad of things that that uh, that have come across our our paths, and uh, so but but that's okay. We we uh, I like it because it is something different every day. Now my path to Raffi carries me back to 1992 uh, when I decided to get in the contract poultry business. Uh, seemed like a good deal. I was uh, not a suit and tie guy. I had a business degree, um, had agricultural experience. I just thought it was a perfect fit, and we found out very quickly that, that the best we're ever going to do is just scrape by. So if you fast forward to the passage of the 2008 Farm Bill, Congress instructed the USDA to, to uh, address some of the problems in livestock production, uh, most notably contract livestock, and most of that was, was contract poultry. And by that time, I was just totally frustrated with the industry, uh, how the companies uh, treated their farmers, they raised their animals, and they hoodwinked the consumer with this kind of halo marketing they use. I didn't know what to do, um, but I got a letter from the National Contract Growers Association. And there was a little excerpt in it from Raffi, and it was looking for farmers to share their experiences. So I called Raffi. They put me on an advisory committee to determine exactly what we wanted out of this farm bill. Through this process, they held my hand, teaching me how to engage with politicians, teaching me about the media. Uh, you know, things didn't turn out exactly like we wanted, but that experience was invaluable. In 2016, I decided to get out of the contract poultry business, and uh, we kind of floundered for a year. And in early 17, I called Benny Bunning, who, if you don't know, he is Raffi's lead farm advocate. Um, and I just told him, I said, man, we're struggling. And he got in his truck and he drove three hours to meet me at my kitchen table. We sat down, we went over my records. He gave us a little advice and a little plan to follow to get us out in what at that time was a short-term crisis. We followed his advice, crisis averted. That day I fell in love with what Benny Bunning did uh, and had a deep respect for the farm advocacy program. In 2018, the opportunity arose for me to uh, answer the hotline calls that come in um, sporadically. And it was after the aftermath, aftermath of Hurricane Florence. And then that kind of progressed to working with, and with Benny um, kind of side by side, but the pandemic kind of changed that. It kind of changed the way we did business. Uh, communication was different. It was no longer shaking hands and it was no longer jumping in the truck and going and seeing the farmer at his house or going to the truck and going and representing the farmer at an ad meeting. We had to uh, use emails, Zoom, whatever, but we, we adapted well. Farmers are resilient. Um, I think we our, our work um, didn't slow down any, so I think we did. We came through it pretty good. And like I said in the opening, we, we deal with an issue of a variety of stuff and it can be something simple as helping a farm get a number all the way to in-depth financial uh, counseling. Some of this farm advocacy work um, here at Ravi, it really changes a farmer's outlook on a, like a bleak situation. Um, it changes lives. And the reason I know that it changed mine. And it's been a privilege and thank y'all for the support and help us do this work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Craig, for that. You may have heard Craig mention that he was a poultry farmer and what his experience was. Next, you'll be hearing from Tyler Whitley, who is the program manager for the Challenging Corporate Agriculture um, Program. That program has, uh, Tyler has been very busy over the last year um, as a result of uh, the problems that the pandemic exposed within the livestock industry. Um, you may have seen stories about the meat processing plant workers not being protected and getting sick. Um, that was one area that we got involved with. And then there's also this resurgence and in interest in expanding uh, local processing facilities because 
there was no meat at the grocery stores for a few weeks and people panicked. So now it's a thing, which is great. Um, so Tyler, do you want to take it away? <clears throat> uh, sure. Uh, thank you. Um, like Edna said, my name is Tyler Whitley. Uh, I'm the program manager for the Challenging Corporate Ag um, program. Um, and, you know, we work with farmers like Craig that get trapped in an extractive corporate controlled system. Um, you know, most specifically industrial animal agriculture. Uh, for about 30 years, we had a, a contract ag reform program that worked with contract ultra growers, chicken growers, uh, mostly broilers, uh, growing for meat, that sort of thing. Um, but over the last four years, we started to hear more from other sectors um, outside of contract poultry, a very similar story of um, unchecked corporate power and how that was affecting other types of farming from cattle, um, independent uh, livestock producers, access and processing like Edna mentioned, and also um, impacting workers in rural economies. So, um, you know, we shifted the focus of the program to be broader, to try to bring together um, different constituencies that hadn't previously worked together. Um, industrial animal ag exploits farmers, workers, rural communities, and consumers. Um, it leads to the elimination of small businesses, drives down wages, and uh, makes employee working conditions worse. And we're building a movement to take on that unchecked corporate power, um, working with farmers, workers, uh, rural communities, but also animal welfare groups, environmental groups, and folks from the Midwest and West Coast. I'm um, really trying to go outside the box and work with different um, people who have aligned values and giving individual people, farmers like Craig or workers, a mic to speak truth to power and advocate for change uh, with their elected officials. Um, and we're also building out the alternative. The alternative, like Edna mentioned, is a small scale pasture raised um, livestock an alternative to the industrial system, something that can withstand a uh, shock to the system like pan, uh, the pandemic created, where farmers can get products directly to consumers. Um, and so, you know, right now we're working in North Carolina to expand um, small independent meat processing facilities to provide more opportunity for farmers. So there's not that bottleneck around processing. Um, and that will, you know, make uh, independent pasture raised livestock and meat products uh, more competitive price wise to the industrial counterpart. Um, as you've seen in the slideshow, a lot of our work is meeting with elected representatives and bringing farmers there. Um, we've done a lot of farmer fly ins over the past few years up to DC so that folks can talk to their uh, elected Congress people and uh, senators. But, um, you know, that's not really possible in a pandemic. So we've tried to shift to more virtual things, um, emails and calls to elected representatives and a lot of planning, a lot of organizing, um, trying to, you know, grow our roots deeper and wider, you know, throughout our community, um, throughout the larger ag community as a whole. And um, yeah, I really appreciate y'all taking the time out of your day to listen to us and for all the support that you provide to us. It means a lot to the folks laboring in the ag system. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Tyler. One of the things that I love the most about working at Rafi is the collaborative nature in which we work. We get input and feedback on most decisions. I do as well in the work that I do. And it definitely happens within the programs. Um, one example of this collaborative work style is the fact that we have these teams. It was the direct service team, which was mentioned earlier. We also have a policy team. And within this policy team, we have several members uh, from the staff from different programs who come together to share their experiences within their own programs and translate that experience into policy. So next we're gonna hear from Margaret Crone Lukens, who's the chair of the policy team, who will tell us more about the work that she's been doing as a chair. Thanks, Margaret. Thank you. Um, yeah, as y'all heard um, in all of the program areas, 2020 was pre pretty wild. We um, 
so just quickly that year, there was a lot of figuring out what the impacts were gonna be on the food system, advocating for relief for those impacts, um, and then also advocating for improvements to the implementation of that relief. Um, in this coming year, we're seeing a lot of opportunity. Um, <clears throat> some of the goals we're working towards are, um, again, COVID aid, which is distributed equitably, uh, debt relief for small farmers, more accountability for USDA, uh, particularly on matters of racial discrimination, um, stronger local and regional food systems, in particular, as Tyler mentioned, um, infrastructure support for things like processing, as well as storage and transportation, um, as Tyler mentioned, corporate accountability, um, and also policy that helps farmers be climate heroes. Um, and we do our work in a number of ways. There is that element of trying to keep farmers and the general public informed about what's going on on the Hill. Um, can be a little hard to keep track of when it's not your full-time job. Um, so letting folks know where and when it might be helpful to advocate with elected representatives um, or contribute a public comment. Um, so action alerts, things like that. Um, and as Tyler mentioned, also organizing organizing meetings directly between farmers and their members of Congress. So we're working on a fly-in this week. Um, we also do grass tops advocacy uh, where we have built relationships with a member of Congress or their staff. Um, and we can either go directly to them with concerns or they often come to us with specific questions or wanting feedback in an area where they know that we have expertise. Um, and we participate uh, with a number of coalitions. So sort of pursuing all of the strategies there. Uh, one example of how we do this work is that um, many of the financial crisis cases, um, which Craig and Benny, our farmer advocates work on, um, are discrimination cases. So uh, a Farm Services Administration loan officer could delay a farmer's annual operating loan until it's too late for that loan to do any good. Um, and the farmer then loses the season or an agent might forget to tell a farmer of color about programs which they are eligible for, um, while all of the white farmers in the area are getting told about the program. Um, I spoke with one farmer of color who didn't hear about programs he should have been able to take advantage of until he spoke with an agent outside his county. Um, and when he asked his local agent about those programs, the agent said, where did you hear about that? Like, who let the secret out, basically? Um, so that leads us to advocate for policies like there should be an annual discrimination review of every FSA loan officer's portfolio, or there should be a report comparing how long it takes for different loan applications to be completed. Um, and that report should be broken down by race and gender. Um, so there, there are things that we can advocate for both administratively directly with USDA and legislatively through Congress, um, sometimes Obviously, depending on the administration, you can get things done faster administratively, but it can be more lasting to have those things written into statute by Congress so that the next administration doesn't just get to decide to stop doing them. Um, so we're seeing a lot of those opportunities coming up in 2021, uh, both in Congress and um, via direct engagement with the administration. Um, and it is also the right time to be framing these larger issues and conversations and building the foundations for the next farm bill in the hope that we can um, have a farm bill that promotes more systemic change um, and doesn't just prop up the status quo that we know is not working for so many farmers. Um, and we think our issues have momentum and support um, and in partnership with farmers and with partner organizations and also with you all, um, we're going to push them as far as we can. Um, so thanks so much for coming. It's uh, great to get to share about our work with y'all. Thank you, Margaret. Um, I'm being told that we're a little bit behind schedule, so I'm going to shorten uh, my wrap up so we can move on to the Q&A. Um, I hope that through the pres staff presentations, you were able to get a better understanding of the programs of what we do, um, what the last year has been like, and what our plans are uh, for the coming year. We are in a transition mode, we're in growth mode, and we're adapting to the changing environments. And th things are continuing to change pretty drastically uh, across the sector, the nonprofit sector and within agriculture. Um, I wanna thank you for joining us today. This is the first time we've done it, like I said before, and I'm pretty happy with the results. I think we, it went pretty well. Um, I wanna say how grateful we are for your donations. Um, the donations that we get from individuals are critically important to the work that we do. 
it provides unrestricted funding and allows us to take risks and to adapt and respond to uh, changing needs. And if anything, if we've learned anything this past year is that we need to be ready to respond quickly uh, to changing environments.